you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to Acts chapter 16? Acts chapter 16. We're going to begin in just a moment, reading in verse 11. Again, I want to thank everyone that participated last night, that was so involved last night. Uh, you may not have been here, but this was a cakewalk event right through here. We walked right around there and we had 20 different individuals that won cakes. I was not one of them, uh, but uh, it was a blast and uh, just a fun night all around. I think we're going to try to do it again next year with uh, the cook-off. I'll defend my record. Um, <laughs> I'm the mathematician in the household, I told him, so when it comes to figuring out measurements, I do that a lot, and uh, I did brown the beef, I cut the stuff, but uh, it was Karen's recipe, I will <laughs> admit that. But anyway, Acts chapter 16, verse 11, we're going to look at it uh, in just a moment. You know, there are multiple people, or multiple ways, rather, that we might identify with a person or an entity or group. For instance, I have a wedding band. I'm glad that I could get that back on. I have never, can remember hardly ever taking my wedding band off, but last month when I had surgery, they were trying to get it off. I thought it was gonna take longer to get the ring off than the surgery because I have put on a little weight since I put that on. We did get it off, and uh, but it's back on today. And what is that? That identifies me with my wife, uh, Karen. Uh, there are many fans of athletic teams, and you might see them wear colors on game day, or you may see those little flags that wave in the air when the cars drive by and try to figure out uh, where they are. There are probably not a lot of Dallas Cowboys ones uh, waving around right now because of uh, most recent events. I'm a Redskin fan. <laughs> and then there are those bumper stickers where parents identify with their children. You know, my child is an honor student at Buckingham County Elementary School. Those things grate me a little bit, I'll be honest. I've never seen one that has said, my child flunked Algebra 2. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. Um, when I was at Hamden, Sydney a number of years ago, I was part of a social fraternity and there was a handshake that would identify you with the group. You could only come into the room if you knew the handshake. There was a table, a public table that was understood as that particular table. So if you sat there, you identified with that particular group of people. Uh, there are things that we do, things that we wear that would identify us with various individuals or entities, but sometimes we don't want to identify with someone. Years ago, uh, when my feet were more stable and I didn't twist my ankle as often, I used to uh, clean the roadsides right out here. And uh, I was working one afternoon and uh, my daughter Whitney was on the activity school bus. And as they were making their way toward, at that time, Shepherd's Country Corner, I was working hard filling up those bags and one of Whitney's friends named Charlotte said, look, there's a hobo on the side of the road <laughs> cleaning. And she actually thought it was a hobo. She did until she did a double take and she said, oh, Whitney, that's your dad. <laughs> And first, Whitney acted as if she didn't hear her, and then secondly, she acted as if she didn't know me, because she wouldn't be the type that would put a bumper sticker that would say, my dad cleans the side of roads for free. But you know, today, as we look at Paul's second missionary journey, we're going to see the conversion of an individual. We're going to see more than the conversion. We're going to see three ways that this lady, Lydia, identified herself as a Christian. Look with me at Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 11. It says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony in a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed in the city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptized, she urged 
charged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today and we see, Lord, the exciting story of the conversion of a woman who was seeking you. But Lord, we see more than that, you were seeking her. But Father, as we look at her life and we have just this brief glimpse of it, Lord, there are things that we see uh, about the change in her life and how she identified with you. And we pray, Lord, for those of us who are in Christ, that we would be clearly identified as followers of you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we saw last week that God was directing Paul on this second journey. There were a lot of changes. There was a different team. Barnabas was not with Paul. Silas was now with Paul. Young John Mark, who had abandoned the team during the first journey, it was determined by Paul would not accompany him on the second journey, but they found another young man, Timothy, who accompanied them on this particular trip. But what led Paul into Europe was this vision we saw last week of a man in Macedonia who was basically pleading for Paul and the team to come where he was. And so we see that Paul followed that impetus. He followed that leading, which was the direction of God. And so in verse 12, we see here that he arrived in a leading city of Macedonia, Philippi. Philippi was named after Philip of Macedon. You may not know who he was, but you would know his famous uh, son, Alexander the Great. And so the city was named after Alexander the Great's uh, father uh, a number of years before uh, what we read here in this. And it is described as a leading city in Macedon. It wasn't the capital city. Thessalonica was that. Nonetheless, it was an influential city. It was was very influential in the culture of that particular province. Many military and political figures, Roman figures, actually lived in the city. And so it was very prominent. It was a prominent passageway. But also, importantly, we see that it is the first city that is mentioned where Paul is ministering. And then this city of tens of thousands, Luke tells us, as he was accompanying Paul on this trip, uh, about a woman named Lydia and how Lydia came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. I wonder today, have you come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ? Have you heard the gospel and have you personally said, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? This woman, Lydia, did so. And it's very interesting because she's only mentioned here in the Bible. You know, a lot of people say, I didn't realize that until I was studying this week, that Lydia uh, may well not have been her given name at birth. It actually may have represented the area from which she came. Much like if someone were to see us in, in a, a foreign place and they would just call us Buckingham. They would sort of associate where we were from. We don't know. But we do know about this woman, Lydia, wherever her name uh, came from, we know that she was a businesswoman, that she dealt in purple dyed textiles and only the wealthy would deal in such things. And so we know that she was really a person in all likelihood who was well uh, recognized and connected with some of the influential people in society. But today, as we look at Lydia, I want to see briefly her conversion but then I want us also to note her post-conversion life. And we're going to see that there's some significant things that happened in her life as a result of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at it today, uh, there are things that we see in her life that also should mark our lives if we're in Christ. There are things that should be emulated in our life. Simply put, Lydia's belief in the Lord Jesus Christ led her through these identifying marks to demonstrate herself as a follower of Christ. And the first thing I want you to note with me is that she identified with Christ by receiving believer's baptism. 
You know, the gospel was expanding as we see here in Acts chapter 16, and it was expanding to the Gentiles. We know that Paul wrote to the Romans that the gospel was come to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And we saw how in his first missionary journey, then on the Sabbath day, he would go into uh, the synagogue areas and he would minister uh, to the Jews, but he would also minister to the Gentiles. And so here in the second journey, we see some things that are similar and some things things that are different. What was similar was this. He was ministering on the Sabbath day. We saw that during the first missionary journey, that there would be a public ministry on the Sabbath day. And so we see that he went out and he sought outside of the city, the place of prayer. Now there's one thing that was different though. Whereas in the first trip, when we looked at Pergamum or in places where, uh, where he uh, had visited, we know that he went into the synagogues. There's no mention here. Rather than look for the synagogue, he was looking for the place of prayer where followers of God would be. Now, historians tell us likely the reason he did not go to the synagogue is there may well have not been a synagogue there because for a synagogue to be placed in a town or a city, there would need to be at least 10 Jewish males. And so follow the, this train of thought. Uh, through the dispersion, the Jews were leaving Jerusalem. They were matriculating they were moving out into other areas, but we're moving much farther west now, and there may well have not been as many Jews in these places. But there were people, and there was Lydia. She was a God-fearing woman, and, and Paul preached, and she believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. She was in all likelihood a Gentile woman who had heard about a God and who desired to know God. But there's something very important for us as we observe this verse here, and it's found in verse 14. It was the Lord who opened her heart. Look at what it says, verse 14, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. In other words, she showed up at the place of prayer. Paul preached. It was not she, it was not Paul who converted her. It was the Lord who opened her heart. Uh, my favorite uh, preacher has gone to be with the Lord, Dr. Adrian Rogers, and I still love listening to him. And Dr. Rogers, I've heard him say uh, more than once, he said, I can speak truth but only the Holy Spirit can impart truth. You see, someone can preach his heart out, but unless the Lord through the Holy Spirit convicts a heart, then that person cannot be saved. The scripture says here, the Lord opened her heart and she was changed. And when she was changed, she was a new woman. She believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, Lydia did. And the very next thing she did was she was baptized. Look at verse 15. After she and her household were baptized. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward commitment. It is the very first public identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lydia and her household were baptized. And in this early season as a, a believer, we see that she followed the Lord in believer's baptism. She wasn't the only one. You remember uh, Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, the eunuch was baptized. We're going to see uh, the same is true as we go on in our study here in Acts during this second journey, that when people believed that they were baptized. And so she identified with Christ in a first step of public profession through baptism. But I want you to see a second truth. She identified with Jesus Christ by ministering to others. Immediately after she was baptized, we see a quote. It says, after she and her household were baptized, verse 15, she urged us, she implored them, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. In other words, she's saying, now that I'm a believer, and if you acknowledge me as a believer, then allow me to minister to you. And so one of the ways that she identified in this case was ministering to the body of Christ. And she was not the only one 
who upon receiving the grace of God would minister to others. Uh, you re may remember in Luke chapter 1 that Jesus was in the home of, of Peter. And as he was there in Simon Peter and Andrew's home, the scripture says that Simon Peter's mother-in-law was in bed ill. And Jesus went and touched her. She was healed. And the scripture said that she got up and she did what? She immediately began to serve them. Here are two women, Lydia here in Acts chapter 16, and, and in a different way receiving the grace of God and the touch of God and a physical healing, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, but both of them upon receiving this unfavored grace of God immediately had a heart to serve. I wonder today, do you have a heart to serve others? For the glory of God, not so that you can pat yourself on the back, no, not so that you can check off a box, but do you have a true heart to minister to others? You know, in Mark 10, in verse 45, Jesus, in speaking about himself, said, I, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. In fact, our Lord came primarily to serve. In John chapter 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet and then he told them, go and do likewise. One of the best ways that you and I can identify ourselves as Christians is to serve for the glory of God. And when a person is saved, we're going to be like Jesus. We're not just going to love Jesus. We're going to be like him. And Jesus himself came in order to serve. You see, as we look at Lydia, we don't know what she did not have. We know what she did have. She had a home. And she offered her home through the gift of hospitality. She opened up her home. She said, if you consider me to be a, a Christian, Paul, then please stay where I am here. Y'all can stay in my home. And you can use this as a hub from which you can rest. And then you can go out and do ministry in this area. You know, when we serve with a pure motive, as Lydia had, God is glorified in it as we identify with Jesus Christ. Lydia didn't have to be prodded. She wanted to serve. She was begging to be able to serve. You know, Christianity is not a spectator religion. It's not something that we just sit back. It really, we ought to be like a colony of ants. We ought to all be industrious for the Lord. God's ordered the church that it's a body made up of many members. And as many members act for the sake of the whole body, so as we serve the Lord in the church, we're ministering to others. We're identifying with Christ. So we see here that Lydia, upon being baptized, her first identity, secondly, was identifying by saying, I want to serve God. I want to serve God. I wonder today, is that in your heart in 2024? As you yourself have received the grace of God, you say, God, I want to be used in your kingdom. I want to be used in your church. I want to be not just someone who sits on the sidelines, but someone who serves for your glory. But then I want you to see a third way that she identified. She identified with Christ by being in association with other believers. When a person follows Jesus Christ, he or she should first be baptized. And through the act of baptism, publicly identifying, I am in Christ. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. And through this act of baptism, it may not be saying a verbal word, but through the action, I'm identifying with Jesus Christ. And so we see that we first identify through that. With Lydia, then she followed that up by ministering. She opened her home. She opened herself, though also we'll see, to communion with the fellowship of believers. You know, the fellowship of the church is a beautiful thing. I wish you could have seen a group of people walking around to music in here. If you were from a foreign country, you'd probably say, these people are crazy. What are they doing in here? But it was so much fun. And, and as Christians, you know, Hebrews, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That as Christians, we should unite ourselves with the local body of believers. Lydia didn't say, 
Thank you, Paul, for saving me. We'll see you guys. Have a great life. No, she said, let me hang with you. She urged the believers to stay in her home. You know, many people will profess Christ, but there's no real evidence of that, in, in, specifically in this area of being affiliated in, in the local church. You know, looking back at that bumper sticker uh, analogy that we mentioned earlier, suppose someone had a bumper sticker that said uh, champion fisherman, but then upon further inspection, they don't have a fishing boat, they don't have a tackle box, they don't have a rod and reel, they have no lures, they, they, they have no fly fishing equipment and they haven't been fishing in 10 years. And, and that's a misrepresentation. If we profess Christ, we should desire and delight in the fellowship of the local church. Do you call yourself a believer? Now, I know there are reasons people work. I know there are health reasons that can hinder well-intending people from being involved in the fellowship. But all things else, if you're a follower of Christ, you should delight and desire to be around other Christians. You see, Lydia was ministering, but she also was being ministered to. She was enjoying the fellowship of the local church. I wonder, have you united? Are you involved in the ministry of the local church? But I want you to see something further. When Lydia identified with Paul and when she identified with this group, see, when you open your home, it was more than just say, hey, come on in. You actually were identifying with the individual you invited. When she did that, that was a significant decision. She was a new creation in Christ, and it may well have come with a cost to her. Follow this thought. Paul was new to the area. No one knew Paul. Paul was preaching the gospel, which was accepted by many, but others were offended. We had already seen that in the first journey. And not only that, we're going to see next week that he healed another woman who was actually profitable to people in the area. And when he uh, saved her and when she was changed, she was no longer profitable and people began to turn against her and they turned against Paul and Paul was incarcerated. Now this was the man who was staying at Lydia. Now the scripture doesn't say it, but I don't think it's a far stretch. It happened in Philippi. All of a sudden, Paul has done this. This, this man has really invaded our area. Something new is here. People were agitated and it probably said, who is this man and where is he staying? And I could almost hear them say, staying at Lydia's house. And immediately, she was considered persona non grata. She was considered an outsider in her own place. We don't know for certain all those dots were connected, but I can tell you this. When she invited her, opened her home to Paul and his companions, she was identifying and saying, I'm with you guys. I'm with you guys. You know, every day we as Christians make a decision. Am I going to identify myself as the believer I am? Am I in the workplace going to be distinct? Are people going to look at me and say, he's with them, the believers? Or is it going to say, he's one of us? Every day we have a decision. Will I identify myself as a follower of Christ. When Lydia opened her home to these believers, she was saying, I'm with them. It may have cost her some wealthy customers who did not understand. It may have led to the wrongful slandering of her name. It may have cost her some friends, but she had a new ID. She was a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, she wasn't the only one who so identified with God's people. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, we read the roll call of faith. We read about that great 
Old Testament Saint Moses. And it says in Hebrews 11, 24, listen to what it says about Moses. It sounds very similar to how we would describe Lydia. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose what? To suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt since he was looking ahead to the reward. What does it say about Moses here? He identified with the people of God. He could have ignored the people of God, but he identified with them. He was willing to suffer temporary loss, whether it be wealth or whatever, because he was looking ahead to the reward. Lydia had a new identity when she accepted Christ. She was a new person. The scripture says if any person is in Christ, that one is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things become new. She had a new identity, and we could see it through the act of baptism. We could see it by the fact that she had a heart now to minister for God's glory, that she desired the fellowship of the local church. Simply put, when Lydia believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, she was all in. Soon after she ministered, she fellowshiped with others. You know, looking at my wedding ring, I wear it proudly because it identifies me with my wife. And you know, those bumper stickers that uh, get on my nerves about the bragging parents, um, I can bear with them. i tell you why. Whether I like that they're bragging or not, they are identifying with their child. They're showing that they're proud of their child. But the question I have for you and me is this. What about us and the Lord? Do we identify with him? Is there no mistaking that we're all in? And the decisions that you make every day, are they decisions that are befitting and identify you as a believer? Those with whom you associate, the things that you watch, the things that you observe, do those things identify you as a Christian or is it sort of cloudy? The thing I love about Lydia, while not much is said about her, we know she was on the right path because after believing, she carried out these characteristics that clearly identified her as a follower of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these narrative portions of the scripture that tell the stories of individuals who have believed on you. We thank you for Lydia, that Lord, in these few verses we studied today, that there was a clear change in her life that she said, if you consider me a Christian, Paul, let me serve you, that she opened her home, that she was baptized, that, Lord, in the brief verses that we study her life, we can all attest to the fact that she had a new identity, and that new identity defined her decisions, her associations, her direction. Father, if there be any here today who have not trusted Christ, I pray today that you would open their hearts even as you open Lydia's. Father, some here who have done that, but to be honest, have been sort of waffling back and forth without clarity. Lord, I pray this year, 2024, that those of us who believe in you would clearly draw the line and say, I identify with Christ, and that identity means that there are things I'll include in my life, people I'll include in my life that I may not have done before, and there'll be, there'll be individuals we will not include, things we will not include that may have been true in the past. So, Father, we pray you would open our hearts today, and we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if God has spoken to you today, but God is still in the business of opening people's hearts.